All right then. Hi folks, can you hear me? Yes. All right. I'm just make sure that you are saying either yes or no throughout the whole meeting. I want this to be uh, more interactive. Uh, this shouldn't really turn into a lecture, right? We are here to learn. Am I screen visible as well, right? Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay. Thanks for the response. So welcome to introduction to deep learning. This event is in collaboration with Intel SAP, which is Indian Student Ambassador Program and deepening.ai community uh, events. Uh, before we jump into the actual event, I'd like to show you folks a video by Andrew NG. He is uh, the founder of deepening.ai and uh, throughout all the deepening.ai community events, we saw an introductory video by him. So this Give me a minute. I'll just share my screen again. And once we have seen the introduction video, we'll move forward with the rest of the event. Meanwhile, if any of your friends are planning to join in, do let them know. Hello, deep learners. I'm Andrew. Now, can you all uh, hear what's on the screen? If anyone can just unmute yourself and let me know. Yes. Yes, it is. Audio. You can hear the audio, right? Okay. Founder of deep learning. Hello, deep learners. I'm Andrew Ng, founder of DeepLearning.ai, and I'm excited to welcome you to our global deep learning community. I know that many of you are here today because you want to break into AI and build your career. I hope that being part of this community will help you to do so. To give you a proper welcome, I'd like to show you around the DeepLearning.ai offices and meet some of the teams so we can see where it all happens. Oh, hi, Andrew. Um, do you want to tell our friends at Pine AI what you do at Deep Learning AI? Sure. Hi, everyone. I, I make articles and other media that help people learn about AI and help them understand the huge impact that AI is having in the world. Today, I'm putting together the next issue of The Batch, our weekly newsletter, and I'm looking for the biggest stories of the week to keep our readers informed. What's been the most surprising thing you've run into working on the batch? How much is going on in this field? There is never a dull moment. I, you know, you might think from the outside that machine learning engineers really understand everything about AI, but nobody understands everything about AI because this field is just coming to life right before my eyes as I put this thing together every week. All right, I know you're really busy, so let's get back to it. Thanks, see you later. Let's go meet Jian, who helped me create the deep learning specialization. He's working on an exciting new project. Hey, Jian. So, do you want to tell the people at Pine AI what you're working on? Yes, sure. Um, I'm doing a project for Cortera, uh, focusing on helping uh, people get offers in AI and navigating their career by uh, testing their skills. Uh, preparing for interviews and certifying them, as well as uh, matching and referring them to good jobs. Yeah. That's really cool. 
And what's the most exciting part of your day? You know, the AI field is new. Uh, organizations and jobs are still misunderstood. So I'm excited to help people understand what different types of jobs exist in the field, uh, what tasks they will work on, and what skills are needed to achieve those tasks. Okay, that's really important work. Well, it's nice chatting. And now let's go chat the hotel who is on their product team. Do you want to say hi to our friends at Time AI and let them know what you're working on? I would love to. Hi, everyone. I think the product team in deep learning.ai, where we create AI education content accessible to people all around the world. People like you. And what are you most excited about right now? I am so excited to see our community grow and to see how eager people are to learn more about AI. Thanks, Elsa. So as you can see, our team is working hard to support you and help you learn. It's never been easier than before to break into AI. So if you want to build a career, you can leverage online resources available, including open source code, data sets, papers, and online courses like the deep learning specialization on Coursera. As part of this journey, I hope you get your hands dirty too. Don't be afraid of diving in to build your own project. Or go ahead and try to replicate a research paper that you're excited about. One thing that I've seen help a lot of people succeed is if you can build a community or find a community of fellow deep learners you can meet with and study with on a regular basis. In fact, I hope that this Time AI meetup that you're at right now will be a good place for you to meet these people. I hope you enjoyed the event today and that you learn a lot both from the talks and from each other. And once again, welcome to the deep learning.ai community. All right, I hope uh, the entire audio, uh, video and audio went well. I just again send my screen and we'll get started with the event. You can just put in yes in the chat if everything was good. If not, just let me know. I'll share the video again, but I hope that that's not necessary. Okay. Okay, now once again, can you see the screen? Yes, we can see. Okay, so now I actually want the uh, whole session, uh, the part where I speak and tell you about uh, deep learning to be quite a small shot and we'll, uh, you know, after that we'll go to the hands-on learning. I'll show you visualization of neural networks and deep learning and then we'll go to the Q&A session. I want the last two parts to be the longer parts and we'll just quickly go through the uh, theoretical part and then we'll right off dive into the q a and the hands-on session and you, you folks can also uh, have your pieces up right now so that once you get in the hands-on session you can also follow me through because it is quite easy to just visualize deep learning and neural networks and everything okay well this is a quite good quote that I uh, read a couple of weeks ago, and it simply says that a year spent in AI is enough to make one believe in God. And the reason for that is quite deep. If you are a person who has been into AI for a quite quite number of years or even months, if you are into data science, AI, deep learning, then you would know, you would realize that the way we are making deep learning algorithms and the way we are making them think and learn is quite similar to what we are doing. So it makes you believe that if humans can create artificial intelligence, then for biological intelligence like us, that should be a creator. And that's why uh, Alan Pearl is, uh, is uh, he's a Turing Award winner and he has, he has tremendous respect in the scientific community. And this is quoted by him that a year spent in AI will make you believe in God. So this is quite a wonderful quote that I read and I thought I would just share it with you folks. Um, who am I? Uh, I have a few number of roles and uh, today's event, uh, which is in collaboration with Google DSA, Google Developer Student Clubs, Intel Student MS program and depending on AI, 
community meetups uh, these three are the roles with which we have created today's event and to make sure that we introduce all everyone on the campus and outside to understand deep learning and they can uh, if you are interested enough you can actually start learning deep learning from today itself i'll share the opportunities and also share the resources tutorials roadmaps books that you might need to get started okay first of all what's aim and ndl now i'll try to put this in the most simple way possible okay now we have ai ai simply refers to any type of intelligence exhibited by a computer that's it you don't need to go into further details or uh, you know theoretical de definitions it simply refers to an intelligence which is exhibited by computer now computer need not be um, a laptop or a server or anything it's just supposed to be a computer and if it exhibits intelligence like us then that's ai right now after ai we have machine learning now machine learning is a branch it, it's a subset of artificial intelligence that is focused on the actual application the actual building of models and and the actual so the real way we actually create this algorithm these models is what we call ma machine learning so that's a subset of ai right uh, I, i actually visualized that particular aspect so in total we have ai it simply refers to uh, you know intelligence exhibited by the machines so the machines who mimic human behavior then we have machine learning which is a subset which is a part of ai right and it also uh, tries to exhibit intelligence but it also refers to the actual process of creating models and algorithms for ai and at the end deep learning is again a subset of machine learning right and it goes a level beyond machine learning where you have multi layered neural networks just like we have neurons in our brain uh, similarly we have artificial neurons uh, in uh, so we create artificial neurons and from all those neurons we create algorithms which try to mimic the human brain and when we put in a lot of neurons and a lot of layers then that multi layered algorithm is a neural network it is a network of neurons and that's what deep learning is right so deep learning as i mentioned it is a subset of machine learning and it is essential because a neural network now the thing is that neural networks can go anywhere from simply two layers to thousands or even millions of layers although i'm not sure why would you need millions of layers uh, but uh, it starts from two and it goes up to n you can also have a single layer deep learning model but then uh, if you only have one layer then you should probably use machine learning and not deep learning right so there you go we have ai it simply refers to intelligence which is exhibited by neurons we have machine learning which refers to the actual process of implementing the algorithms and models and finally we have deep learning and deep learning refers to the actual uh, level beyond mimicking of human brains through different layers of artificial neurons that is deep learning now why do we need deep learning or ai or ml in the first place right now that's for uh, you know there are a lot of reasons why we need deep learning ai in the first place but there are three main reasons the first is that we have so much data right now that there's no way we can understand that data we can use the data properly uh, by using the traditional methods right uh, and that's why we need deep learning that that's the core reason for that we have so much data but we don't have the tools or the traditional tools don't really help us understand that data second thing is we need to discover patterns and trends so uh, one of the most i would say cool or interesting features of ai is predicting stock market right now that is something that requires you to understand the patterns in the price of the uh, stock let's say we are taking tesla then uh, if it is really skyrocketing right now then uh, there is a pattern there right and there are also weekly patterns there are trends in the price of, of a stock so in order and by the way if you know uh, the historical data of any stock has millions of data points so in a single day there are millions of transactions going on at the same time right and if you want to create a machine learning algorithm on that then traditional methods will not help you because there is so much data and there are micro macro and general patterns and trends in the uh, stock price data and 
uh, you cannot really discover those patterns through traditional methods. And that's why you need deep learning, AI, machine learning. And while that depends on how well you want your model to be, and there are a lot of factors you need to take into consideration for AI, ML, DL. But in general, you need at least one of them if you are uh, working on a lot of data. And finally, solving of complex problems. Why? So I'll give you folks an example. When we have a normal traditional method, what we have is we have a formula, let's say x plus y, and then we have an output, which is x plus y. Now, uh, if I'm if I'm trying to run this uh, function or algorithm, what I do is I'll give it the input, let's say x is equal to one, y is equal to two. There is a middle part, which is the execution. What will do x plus y, which is one plus two, three, and the output will, will get is three. This is the traditional setting, right? In the traditional setting, we have the input and we have the algorithm. We have defined set of instructions. What is the instruction? Do x plus y. And we don't have the output. Output is generated through the algorithm, right? This is the traditional setting. What happens in AI is we have the input and we have the output, but we don't have the algorithm, right? And the algorithm tries to understand the instructions. Uh, so if I have a lot of inputs, a lot of outputs, I'll put them in the algorithm. And what the algorithm will try to do is, let's take an example of simple linear regression. Then initially for an output of one plus two and for uh, the, so we have input of one plus two and output of three, it will try, let's say two X plus three Y. Is the answer correct? No, it will try something else. It will, it will go for X plus three Y. Uh, does that give the right answer? No, it does not. So it will keep trying and iterating, not, not just through that one input, it will go through all the inputs and all the outputs. And by iterating thousands, millions of times, it will try to get closer to the perfect equation. So let's say the final, uh, you know, the algorithm or the set of instructions that it get is 0.99 X plus 1.01 Y. And that's fine. We'll never get 100% accuracy, but we can reach up to 99.99. So that's what happens in an AI, in, in uh, AI model, ML model, or DL model, right? So the third main thing is just to solve complex problems. If we don't know what the middle part is, but if we have the first and the, and the last one, that is input and output, then we can do wonders. We can solve complex problems easily because the main part is taken care of by the algorithm, right? I, I hope uh, this much part is clear. You can... I'll give a thumbs up emoji or you can unmute your mic and say yes. Uh, so I just know that uh, I think it's going well. Any doubts up till now? Okay, and then I guess we'll move forward then. Now here are some major machine learning algorithms. Uh, the first one is a category of regression. Regression simply means that you have input, you have output, and then you try to create a line. So if you have one input and one output, then you'll, you'll, you'll try to create a linear regression model, right? But if your data is not linear, then you'll try to create an exponential curve, right? So what will happen is you have input, you have output, and then um, it will plot the data points. It will try to create a line which, fit, which best fits that particular data point, right? So that's regression. You keep regressing and then you try to fit the data and right? that's regression. And for that, we have uh, the two most famous and standard algorithms, which is a linear regression. Where you try to create a Y is equal to MX plus C line. And then you have logistic regression where uh, as we have M into X, which is linear relationship. Here you have exponential E raised to something. You will have an exponential or logarithm. Uh, both are inverse of each other. So you will have either exponential or logarithm relationship between X and Y. And then you also have multivariate regression where you have multiple inputs and multiple outputs and it can also be single input multiple outputs multiple inputs and single output right that's multivariate regression you have multiple variables in the algorithm okay and then you have clustering uh, clustering simply means that uh, you have a lot of data points so just try to visualize this Let's say that this entire plane is X, Y axis, right? You have several data points. Uh, there are some data points which are of 
let's say blue color some some are of uh, orange color now uh, this is very fundamental segregation and the data points can be let's say for sentiment analysis where something is positive and something is negative it can also be um, a spam filter for example in e uh, email spam in you you cluster the emails into either spam or not spam so you have a lot of data points and what clustering does is it clusters those data points and one cluster is different from other cluster and each and every cluster has um, different attributes different properties right so let's say that we are doing sentiment analysis and we want to understand whether um, the review of a food delivery app is positive or negative right so uh, one cluster can have positive words in it such as it was great uh, the food was good it was tasty it was healthy in the negative, we can have words such as um, it was rubbish, it was uh, fake, or it was the delivery came late, and all, all those things. Right. So you, you can see that both these data points, both of these clusters inside the entire data uh, space, both these clusters have different properties, and that's why you can classify the points into something as uh, like uh, like something positive, negative. You can have something like fake or genuine. You can have um, one color versus another color. So you can just form clusters and, and there cannot be only two clusters. You can have multiple clusters, five, 10, thousand. It, it simply depends on your application, right? So that's what clustering is. And we have instances. And by the way, in clustering, the most famous one is K means clustering. K simply means the distance between the clusters or the level of and the thing is no. um, algorithms. Did I stop there? Uh, it said that my internet connection is not good. I hope I'm audible. Can you just unmute your mic and say yes or no? Yes, you are audible. Okay. So I think I was lagging a bit there, no issues. So basically, I said that uh, we have clustering algorithms that cluster data points into different clusters who have different properties. And the most famous one in there is k-means clustering. Then we have instance-based algorithms, right? And uh, the most famous one, and we'll understand instance based on that, is support vector machines. What support, support vector machines do is they do both the things. Uh, it depends on your application, but it does regression it also does classification we'll take an example of classification what it does is it creates a space there are points and then uh, support vector machines try to create a hyperplane which divides the data points into different parts and this can be n dimensional space where you have uh, n dimensions let us say we have this is a 3d place like space and in the 3d space the hyperplane is a 2d plane right we have space and it is separated by a plane right and if we have a 2d space then a line is the hyperplane which separates things right so we have n dimensional uh, space and we have n minus one uh, n minus one dimension plane which separates the space right and that's how support vector machines work and they're really used quite often in machine learning applications so uh, and, and the main one, neural networks, which we are going to take a look through the hands-on session, neural networks. Uh, the most common ones are uh, ANN, uh, neural network is equal to ANN. When we talk about neural networks, we basically talk about artificial neural networks. And when we go a step further, we have recurrent neural networks. So let's say, uh, we'll actually come to neural networks. So I'll just skip them for now. And then the uh, final thing is decision trees. Decision trees are more of if and else statements, but with one huge improvement. So when, when we input the data, we have thousands of data points. It will try to create if and else statements. We start from something. If this, then you go to this tree, this branch in the tree. If not, then we'll go to this branch in the tree, right? And then those uh, the, the main tree will have different branches spread across, right? Now, you might think that this is simple if and else state because we are not telling the algorithm when to do what. So 
when i said that it goes from top and it comes to bottom and it checks for a condition we are not defining the condition the condition is defined by the algorithm itself right so we are not defining anything the algorithm decides what the condition is and it defines thousands of conditions on its own and that's why the decision trees are also used quite a lot when you want to classify things if you have three or four variables then you will create a decision tree it will it will go for okay the first input is this some uh, is it true and you go here then it tests for the second uh, second input it will it will again check whether uh, one condition is uh, verified or not if yes then it will go here if no then it will go here let us say it goes here and after that it will check for the third input and it will say okay is this condition satisfied yes then it will go here and if not then it will go here let's say it's a yes then it goes here and finally we can classify it it gives us the output right so that's how the decision trees work okay now let's move on to the neural networks uh, the reason why we are here the deep learning introduction to dl so neural networks or artificial neural networks now ann is simply a machine learning model it is also a deep learning model every deep learning model is a machine learning model so it's a ml or dl model designed to simulate the way human brains work how do human brains work we have one input so let us say that i'm moving my hand right now and when i'm moving my hand i'm feeling the air and that and that signal is uh, like it sent through my hand through the neurons right here so let's say that this, this is the input right now right and the output is what i feel here okay and everything in between are the hidden layers of neurons right so it goes from here right right up in my spinal cord and then into my brain and then a lot of complex uh, calculations happen in my brain and then i finally feel the air in my hand right so this is basically what happens in a neural network there is an input we can have one or multiple inputs then there are hidden layers and those hidden layers perform a lot of calculations and at the end we get an output and that output is uh, that output can also be a single output or multiple outputs that doesn't really matter and that's how uh, neural networks work and neural networks what they try to do is uh, when we are training these models uh, so we need to train the models right if if i am i am let's say 20 years old right now then the reason why i'm able to speak english the reason why i'm able to operate a computer is because throughout the 20 years i have been like i have experiences what are those experiences i can move the mouse i, I can do quite a lot from a number of things why because i have inputted data into my mind right if i started walking then when i walk i kept walking i kept falling that was data that data was fed into my brain right so we have to train the model i was trained so we have to train the artificial model as well right so when we are training the data we are basically uh, you know iterating through the hidden layers the conditions and the calculations in those hidden layers right so that is what is iterated during the training process and we okay so uh, here are some basic applications uh, we have finance electronics tax services government the finance one is quite simple fi financial institutions use it to predict stock markets and uh, finance and markets in general it doesn't really have to be stocks it can also be mutual funds it can be cryptocurrencies um, it can be quite a lot of number of things so financial institutions really uh, take a Uh, like they use dl to maximum degree they use neural networks quite um perfectly i would say because they have a lot of number of resources they can spend a lot of time a lot of uh, money a lot of uh, investment into the hardware everything i actually heard that uh, financial institutes actually spent couple of tens of millions of dollars just to improve the cable line that performs the transactions the hardware so they have a lot of resources they can spend a lot of money so that their machine learning or deep learning model can execute a lot of transactions through the model and we have tax services for example google uses that for speech recognition when we train the uh, speech rec uh, recognition model we are inputting uh, the voice voice in is in terms of zeros and ones 
and what it, what it then does is it tokenizes our words and the, in, then it tries to understand them and how does that happen it keeps changing the values uh, or the calculations in the hidden layers and th that's how they work this is oversimplification but you get the point right and government of course they, they use that for a lot of things the most famous one is object uh, detection if you have heard of computer vision or yolo v5 framework then you can have a stream of video right now i'm here you and if i and if this camera uh, has a deep learning model uh, so the, so this camera is uh, you know attached to the software and the soft if the software is running a ai model then it can also detect me it can detect this uh, frame here we can detect a lot of things so governments really use uh, uh, take a good use of uh, deep learning and machine learning models to have computer vision tasks and the main one is object detection and classification and then we have electronics um, if you have heard then a lot of chip manufacturers actually create their entire architecture using ai so if it would have taken a specialist to create an architecture in six months ai will do it in with within a day right that's a huge improvement and the architecture will actually be better it will be more efficient it will be more effective so uh, the applications are everywhere these are just the top four examples and then then recurrent neural networks now recurrent neural networks are just one step ahead of ans you have artificial neural network you give it an input it goes through several hidden layers and then you get the output right this is artificial neural network what happens in recurrent neural networks is you have the input it goes to hidden layers and then hidden layers keep looping uh, so there is a back propagation of the data so it keeps looping with each other and then you get the output right so that's a small thing but it's really important because there might be relations where uh, you move your data is moving through the hidden layers and then it needs to go back and then reiterate and in those situations recurrent neural networks are really helpful so and that also has a lot of applications right tech services e-commerce government social media i'll actually share this uh, presentation with all of you so don't worry about um like just cutting down things or worrying about all these uh, examples right i'll share it with you folks okay and now let's get hands on so until now does anyone have any questions if no then just unmute my mic and say no if yes then do let me know no okay Hello. all right now th this is something that all of you can do just open your browser and search for tensorflow play playground i'll actually share the screen tensorflow is a python based library or a framework uh, through which you can create ai ml or dl models and they have a lot of re resources in terms of um, you trying to understand and navigate your way through career in ai in general right so you can search for tensorflow flow playground so as you can see here playground.tensorflow.org when you will open that you will see something like this and this clearly visualizes how uh, like it it really visualizes how the uh, deep learning or like rather than deep learning how neural networks work right and we'll go through that so if anyone is uh, doing this with me you can just raise your hand and let me know so that i know you are doing and i just go a little bit slow so that you can follow me no need to do this with me but if you are just let me know okay so i think a couple of you are so okay so uh, if you want to understand this whole thing then just understand this on on this this side you, you don't need to know all this but i just wanted to have something to show to you folks so that uh, you can actually understand and visualize what i just talked about in the theory part 
So here you can choose the data uh, type. So th this is more of a clustering part where there is an outer cluster and there is an inner cluster. You can also have the different clusters like this. There is, th this is a clear cluster here. One is here and one is there. And then there are spiral clusters. We'll look at all of them, right? Let's start with the basic one. And then we have the option to split the training and test data. Right now it is 50-50. Generally, it is 80-20. Uh, 80% 80, 80 is for training and 20% is for testing the data, right? Right now it's 50. Let's let's uh, move it back to 20% test data, right? The test data has reduced. And noise. Now, noise simply means, so does anyone know what noise is? Anyone? Noise in the data. You can also type it in the chat box if you want. No one? Okay, so uh, if you, uh, let's go here. Here you can clearly see that there is a clear separation between this and this. There is no noise in the data. Everything is perfect, right? Now, if I introduce the noise, if I increase this, then what you will see is the data points are jumbled. There is noise in the data. There is no clear separation. Uh, you cannot uh, you know, do this in a simple way. Uh, you, you cannot create your machine learning models easily. Noise simply means that the data has something that you don't want that to be, right? That's noise. And in data science in general, noise simply means that the data points are, are just randomly clustered. They are outliers. There are intermix. There's intermixing and a lot of stuff. So let's say that we keep the noise. Uh, what is the max value? It is 50. So let's say the noise is 25. Can you do it? Yeah, 25. And the batch size. Uh, let's, let's not worry about the batch size. We'll, we'll keep it at the default. But if you want to increase, then that's not a problem. But we'll keep it that turn. And OK, what else? The learning rate. Now, learning rate simply means how fast you learn or how fast you iterate your assumptions. So as I said, when uh, we take an example of linear regression, it, it tries one uh, set of instructions, x plus 3y. Uh, is it correct? No, you move forward. Is it cor uh, not correct? You again move forward. So that, that is the rate at which you learn, right? So right now, by default, it is 0 0.03. Uh, let's keep it at that because if you keep a high learning rate, then you might have different drawbacks such as uh, your model is overfitting or it is underfitting sometimes. That really depends on the data, but uh, let us keep it at the standard point zero point zero three. You can mess with all these values. Activation. This is an interesting point. Uh, I think let's go with uh, ReLU. ReLU simply means for... Uh, let me think r e l u it, i think it was for regular um let me see relu was for regular relu for it was that followed by sigmoid Okay, the linear equation. So let us let me go to the drawing tool. Okay, so I hope that you all of you are able to see this. I'll try to visualize. Okay, I think this is my. How do I clear this? Okay, this is fine. <laughs> Okay, so let's say, okay, this is quite big. This is our X and Y axis. Okay, now if you would have heard, there is a function like this where there is nothing going on for a certain period of time and then the graph goes something like this, right? So this is a function. Let's say this is the X axis. I'm not using a pen. This is simply my mouse. So my handwriting, this is not X, is it? This is Y. And this is X, right? And basically what happens is that there is a certain point in time 
uh, if x is time or any particular condition after which something gets activated, right? So this is ReLU. It is RE and then LU. This is rectified linear activation. And the reason for that is a lot of times what happens is that when you are trying to train this entire model, you should know what the activation uh, the activation function is. And activation simply means that after a certain point of time, something activates. And that uh, depends on the, so let's say that you are creating a model where it gives you a certain input for a certain period of time. And then once a condition changes, you, you have another function that keeps going, right? In that case, uh, ReLU is really used. But there are, uh, I think, three main ones. I think they have given four, ReLU, Sigma, 10H. Linear, I mean, if you're going to use linear activation function, then why, why are you using uh, machine learning in the first place? So I think ReLU, 10H, and Sigma are the main ones. We'll go with ReLU because uh, in most of my re research papers, I've used uh, ReLU. Regularization, this is, this is simply related to the data. Uh, we'll keep it at the same rate. We'll again keep that same. What's the problem type? So as, as I mentioned, there are two types of, not two, but major two types of uh, like problems or the way we are trying to solve something. It is classification or regression. If you want to classify something into A or B or A, B, C, if you want to classify things, if you want to differentiate things, that's classification. Regression is more about giving an input and giving a customized output. So uh, if we are doing uh, stock market prediction, then we want to understand the exact price uh, at which Tesla will close today, right? What's that? That is a number. It, it is an exact customized uh, output based on input that is regression and if it is spam filtering uh, if i re receive a mail and the uh, google's i mean google cloud if it is version of google cloud uh, what happens is that it takes each and every data metadata the content the images the files attached everything in the mail it sends it to the ai model ddl model or ml model whichever they are using and it will classify is this spam or is it not spam? If it is spam, then put it into the spam section. If not, put it in the general standard inbox section, right? That's classification. There is no customized output. There is either yes or no, spam or no, not spam, right? So that time it is uh, fish that classification. If, if I change that to reg regression, then we'll get something else. But because classification will help you folks understand visually better, we'll uh, stick with classification, right? Let me go back to the first one. All right, that, that's all done. And this is the main part, right? This is where the actual thing happens. He, here we have two simple inputs, x1 and y1. We can go x1 square, x2 square. We have sine x. Uh, I think uh, if we go to a more advanced version of this playground, we also have more input functions, but we'll stick with the base equals x1 and x2. Right, and think, I think we have, okay, so here we get the output, we, have, we can visualize it. The colors are there, so this orange points have similar characteristics and this blue points have similar characteristics, okay? Now, these are the hidden layers. So this first one, uh, like this X1, all this, if you can see my mouse, this is the in input layer, okay? And here right now, we only have two inputs, right? All these are did, uh, disabled right now. Then we have the hidden layers. The current hidden layers are two in the number right now, as you can see. And I can increase the hidden layers right here. Now we have three layers. Let's stick with two of them, right? And inside the layer, we can have neurons. Right now we have four here. Let's increase that to five. And here let's increase this to three. So here we have five layers and we have three layers here, right? And you can also see the uh, this is a toolkit in, if you know about web application, uh, websites in web development in general, and it simply says that this is the output from one year, hover to say it, right? So if I hover over it, then this is the output based on, uh, if, you, if you see this one, keep a look on this output and my mouse, okay? So right now my mouse is over this output. What does this give me? So this one neuron, gives me this separation. Is the separation or this classification good? No, it's not, but we'll get there. So we have another one. 
this is another one then we have this is one right so the different new neurons give me different outputs this outputs then are again fed into the third uh, the second layer like the, the third part or the second hidden layer right and then finally once all this is done this is what we get and right now the epochs are zero so iteration the like you know the looping the iteration is zero right right now and that's why our model is bad it's really bad right now right if i click on this play button let's say i start okay so right now the iteration is 26 and as you can see what started happening is this orange area is classified so this entire space is classified as orange and yes most of the orange data points who have similar characteristic are in the orange space so we are you know uh, we are getting there our accuracy is getting better if i still go on let's say around 40 if you can see uh, the space again got better right if i keep going okay so uh, as you can see there also comes a time when you no longer need to train more so, right so i think uh, it is around uh, epoch number 5050 when uh, accuracy does not increase further right so if i just start okay something happened here uh, it is 12 epochs i'll again go till let's say 27 something like that we have uh, the space or the algorithm that gives us output like this i think it goes until 50 or something yeah uh, yeah, so I, I think it was 60 or 70 when the accuracy uh, started becoming stale, stagnant. It didn't increase after that, right? And we can also keep increasing the layers. So if I keep increasing the layers, I increase the neurons, uh, quite a number of neurons here, right? And let's say that I decrease this even further. Let's say I reduce the noise if I want to. And is there anything else I can change? Let's go with sigmoid. Sigmoid is on the good one, but rel is the most one, or most used one. Well, let's do this. Okay, we are not gonna getting any output right now. Let me increase the test data. I think now we should get some good output. Okay, let's again go with sig rel then. Okay, yeah. Now we are getting somewhere. So as I said, uh, ReLU is one of my favorite ones. So, uh, so as you can see, when we are working with deep learning models, there are a lot of things you need to take into consideration. The number of layers, inputs, or the, the lack of data you have, the test, uh, test training split, I would highly recommend you to use 20, 80%, 20% test data, 80% training data, but you can uh, just play with it if you want noise if i simply re remove the noise then it will be pretty easy for me so if i do this okay by 26 the algorithm is quite good right if i increase the noise let's say 50 it will take quite a lot of amount of time for this to become good right around 40 45 so the noise also yeah, yeah. matters yeah yeah your your screen is not moving like it is stuck. Okay, so since when is it stuck? Can you hear me? Oh, no. Yeah, yeah. I'll reset it again. Yep. Okay, so until when was it uh, visible to every one of you? I hope it's visible now, right? Yeah, now it is visible. Okay, so uh, all I was trying to say was that you can increase the decrease neurons here to visualize whatever you want, right? And so there are a lot of things you need to take into consideration while creating a neural network in general. You have the splitting of data, test data and train data. Uh, you cannot really uh, change the noise because you have the data and uh, you can engineer the data so uh, there is a thing in uh, data science pipeline where you get the data you engineer the data you split the data you create the model you test the model so 
you can change the noise it literally depends on whether you are engineering the data or not uh, but mostly you won't be able to like drastically change the noise it will stay the same as the initial uh, data that you have the batch size i mean the batch size and the number of epochs right here epochs iteration so these two things are something which are highly specific to what you want to do right it changes with each and every application right um make sure that it's most optimal one don't keep it too low it will take a lot of time and resources don't keep it too much because then there will be underfitting overfitting where uh, underfitting and overfitting are simply problems in AI. Uh, if you want to learn more, you can just Google that. But simply, overfitting simply means that you are overfitting to a, a simple kind of data, right? If you have, uh, if you're given it a training, then it will only understand the training data, right? It's like an uh, exam. So if your professor gave you eight examples, eight practice questions, and you solve all of them, but then when the professor takes exam uh, and then the professor gives you two problems and you cannot solve them. Why? Because you are highly trained for those eight questions and not the two questions. That's overfitting. You only know about the training. You don't know about the test, right? So don't keep the learning rate too much. If you keep it too much, then uh, overfitting will happen. So keep a look at that. Then you have activation, as I said. Rileo is one of my favorite ones and the ones that I use in my research papers. Uh, but what you can use standards of sigmoid. I'm not too much sure about linear, why, why you should use linear. Rileo, standards and sigmoid are the ones. Regularization, um, that, that's something that you will get into when you are actually doing some industry level deployed models, right? And, and the same goes for uh, regularization rate. Problem type, uh, it depends on you. Uh, it depends on the application. Right. If you just want to uh, like cluster a few things, if you want to cl classify something, go for a classification. Right. And that depends on the uh, algorithm. Right. You have clustering algorithms, you have uh, regression uh, algorithms and quite a lot of them. So that completely depends on the application. You can also define hidden layers and you can also visualize them. If you want to visualize your models, you can use uh, Seaborn. Matplotlib, these two are the most famous and the most widespread used uh, visualization libraries in Python. Right? I mostly use Python for machine learning AI DL. Uh, and there are two main AI ML DL libraries for uh, it's like uh, Python li libraries for AI ML DL, which are uh, scikit-learn and TensorFlow. Right now, we are going through TensorFlow because it is uh, backed by Google. There is also um, OpenCV for uh, everything related to computer vision, where if you want to detect something, if you want to classify something, OpenCV is the way to go. And there's also EuroVify. I can use EuroVify during one of my internships. So there are quite a lot of frameworks, uh, libraries for implementation, visualization, everything. It is a really huge field. Right, so I'll just stop with the hands-on now and I'll go to the resources you can use to learn uh, AML DL. Okay, I actually uh, created this repository where I have put in the books and everything. So I'll share this in a while. Uh, but if you go to the resources folder, here you have all the books that you might need, right? And uh, I'm quite sure that there should be something for Python and R, yeah. You have a book for Python and you have a book for R. Python is used for quite a lot of things and machine learning and artificial intelligence is one of them. You also have R. R is specifically a statistics uh, language, right? And a lot of people do use R in R Studio for machine learning, right? If you want to learn R language, uh, you can click here and you will get the book for that. Python, you get that here as well, right? Now, there are roadmaps. So, for roadmaps, data science. Data science is something that encompasses everything. AI, ML, DL, data analysis, data analytics. So, if you want to learn that, then there are two roadmaps here. I think both of them are YouTube videos. Yeah. So, you can look at the roadmaps right here. 
Okay. Then there are learning tutorials, and there should be one for data science here. So I think this is a complete playlist, right? So if you want to learn AI ML, you can go through the resources. If you want to learn something else, all these resources are here. I think I created this, I'm not sure, two months, yeah. So around two, two months ago, I created this four months ago, but I updated this two months ago. So if you want to take a look at the you know, roadmap tutorials, uh, anything, if you want to learn AI ML DL, then you can go over to this uh, particular link. I'll actually share this uh, presentation and this link uh, after the event with all of you. And finally, if you want to uh, take a look at the opportunities for uh, data science or AI medial in general, you can simply go to LinkedIn and then go to job section. If you simply search for, let's say, data scientist, okay? But as all of you are students, let's say data science intern. And here you go. You have, I'm not sure, uh, 1,819 1, results on only LinkedIn. And this is simply for data science intern in India, right? So there is, there are a lot of roles, opportunities in terms of data science, right? And there is no way that you will run out of opportunities. There are always opportunities for data science. And so if I just go for, I mean, data science, take care of it. But if you want to go for AI intern, we have 300 results, right? Now let's go for ML. And by the way, this is all just in India. Globally, it will be more than that. For ML intern, we have 1,970, right? So there are a lot of opportunities for AI ML DL. All right, so th this is the complete uh, re resource. resource. <laughs> you, you'll get all the re resources here. I'll share this in a while. All right then. Now, this is more of a Q&A session. If you have any questions, then you can let me know. I'm here. If you want to take a leave, you can take a leave now. All right, I'll just wait for around a minute or so. After that, we'll end the session. Any questions, you can drop them in the chat if you want. Or you can unmute your mic. <laughs> 